Good morning and welcome to one and all on this, as we heard, the third Sunday in Lent. The text that we'll consider this morning is not actually the gospel, historic gospel appointed to be read on this day. Uh, if you were to, and since we're running behind, I won't make you turn to. That was my fault, by the way. <laughs> will come as no surprise to at least one person here. Um, but if you were to turn to page 202 and 3 in the front of your hymnary, you would see there the, the historic lessons for the Christian church, lessons that have been followed for at least 1,500 years. Um, and each Sunday has its own theme, if you will, its doctrinal emphasis. And the text we look at this morning is not the gospel, if you trace it down, the gospel's kind of right in the middle of the, the page there. But if you go over to the right, you'll see the alternate gospel for this day is from Luke chapter 4, verse 31 and following. And it follows the same general theme as do they all. And um, all of this has been done, of course, from the earliest times to help us walk as disciples of Christ, follow his life and his teachings year after year after year. The text then is found in Luke 4, beginning at the 31st verse where we read, In Jesus' name, please arise. Then he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not harm him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What a word this is! For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding regions. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please. Grace be to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ whose authority and power frees sinners and gives life to the dying. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ. Jesus lived in Capernaum by the Sea of Galilee. It's a big lake, you know that. It's really not a sea as we think of it. Why he moved there from the town where he grew up, Nazareth, is unknown. Perhaps it had to do with the business of carpentry, perhaps having to do with the death of Joseph. We do not know. It was there that he began to teach on the Sabbaths in the synagogue, being recognized by the synagogue's elders as one who understood the scriptures well. That was the tradition, you know. If there was a visitor, he would come in and read one of the prophets, like, Isaiah, as we see in another place, and then comment on them. One day, Luke tells us, a disturbing incident took place. A man in the synagogue suddenly cried out, let us alone. Imagine that if, if that happened here. Would that have your attention? I, th I think it would. Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. 
So Luke tells us the people were astonished, amazed at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Well, Jesus held the attention of the people in the synagogue that day, no doubt about it. His words were not like anything they were accustomed to hearing from the priests, the scribes, and teachers of Israel, their usual speakers. His word had authority. It was different also in that the demons of hell were compelled to obey his word. His word had power. Well, what was the difference then between Jesus' teaching and that which the people were used to hearing? Well, there were many factions or divisions within the church in that day. The, we could still properly call it the Church of the Old Testament. And we don't have time to consider all of them and how each might have heard him. Instead, let us restrict our focus to the two major divisions or denominations mentioned frequently in the Gospels, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees, of course, are mentioned by name more than the set, in fact, more than all the others combined, and then some. Though it is clear when the evangelists write, for example, the chief priests and the Pharisees, or the scribes and the Pharisees, they really mean the Sadducees and the Pharisees, because the chief priests and the scribes almost always belong to the party, the denomination, if you will of the Sadducees. The Pharisees were those who took the Old Testament scriptures seriously, literally. The Bible was for them God's book of rules, perfect in every way, prescribing everything one should do or should not do. The one who kept those rules in their view earned God's favor. The Sadducees, on the other hand, did not take the scriptures literally, accepting some parts at faith's value, others not so much. For them, the Bible was chiefly a book of stories and sayings whose value lay in their deeper meaning. The Sadducees also tended to be more worldly than the Pharisees. The power base of the Pharisees was in the synagogues, such as the one in Capernaum, the synagogues in the smaller cities and the towns of Galilee and Judea. The Sadducees' power base was the temple administration in Jerusalem, which they dominated. And we don't need only even to take the Bible on this. There's a lot of literature from the period that makes it very clear that that was the case. And the Bible only deals with the reality that was there. These two factions were constantly trying to wrest power, the one from the other. They debated in public, and guess what they did in private? They argued. Each tried to sway the people to their way of thinking. They agreed on not a lot. <laughs> but they grew to be united in their opinion of Jesus. They didn't like him. And their dislike often and quickly became hatred when he corrected them in front of the people. <laughs> The Sadducees he showed to be doubters of God's word, and the Pharisees self-righteous. In time, these fierce rivals who controlled most of the membership of the great council, the Sanhedrin, would plot Jesus' destruction. He would be put on trial before them on the night in which he was betrayed. Words we'll hear again shortly, won't we? in connection with the Lord's Supper. Together they would cleverly accuse him of rebellion 
rebellion against Caesar to the Roman governor, and so secure a death sentence. Now as we look at these two denominations, and that's what we could rightly call them, within the church of Jesus' day, we can see that their ways of thinking have not disappeared. In fact, their ways of thinking represent the natural reason of man whenever he is confronted with the pure, unchanged, and unchanging word of God causing them to hear it only as law, what am I supposed to do? Or disbelieving it. You've talked to people, haven't you, who take one or the other opinion. And this should not surprise us, for Solomon pointed out long ago what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. They're still around. They are both to be found seated in churches. This is the uncomfortable truth, isn't it? Leading home Bible study groups, standing in pulpits or perhaps striding about the guitar and drum-strewn stages that have replaced pulpits in so many of the churches of America today. The modern-day Pharisee, like his ancient counterpart, takes the Bible seriously. And in this they are to be commended. Because the Bible is the very word of God, authoritative in all of which it speaks. But God did not give his word to us as a rule book for living. That is not its purpose. Now, to be sure, does it tell us how to live? All the kids and you, when you were kids, you were taught the Ten Commandments, weren't you? Yes, of course it does. It tells us what is and is not pleasing in the sight of God. But in doing so, it shows the one who honestly hears it, honestly looks at him or herself in this mirror, this divine mirror, that we have not lived the way it speaks, have we? We have sinned and come short of the glory of God, every single one of us. We all share in Adam's sin, and we are all under God's wrath. Now, we can try to use the Bible as Adam and Eve once used fig leaves, and use it to hide behind. But that's not using the Bible, it's misusing the Bible. Just as they misused fig leaves. Fig leaves are not, well, I don't have to explain that anymore, do I? For the modern Sadducee, on the other hand, the Bible and the Word of God are not the same thing. The Bible for them is what it always was for the Sadducee, a storybook. And whether this or that part is true, they would say, it's not important. No, it's about the deeper meaning. It tells us how people long ago understood God and is working in the world. But God's word teaches us something different today, they say, because we're so much more advanced and intelligent. I always enjoy that one. And so they interpret God's word in the light of their own lives their own experiences, their own emotions, rather than interpreting the deeds and misdeeds of their lives in the light of God's word. Now, despite the differences between Pharisee and Sadducee, whether ancient or modern, they have one thing in common. Both demand that Christ submit to their teaching 
that they, not he, have authority to interpret God's word. What does it mean to you? Oh, come on. Try that one with your husband or wife and see how well it works. Much less God. But you see, the Bible is not the rule book of the Pharisees, and it most certainly is not the story book of the Sadducees. It is exactly what Christ, the only begotten of the Father, said. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. And yet you refuse to come to me that you might have life. You see, Christ is not just the chief topic, subject, doctrine of the Bible. He isn't. He is not just the heart and center of the Bible. He is the only reason it was written. Only reason. God gave his word to man, the truth about sin and death, about salvation and life, and pointed to him. The Old Testament, therefore, has no purpose but to prepare mankind for his only begotten son's coming into the world as Savior. And the New Testament has no purpose but to proclaim that in him salvation has come, just as God promised. Which, of course, is what brings us back to the synagogue in Capernaum. And what so astonished people that day? What did Jesus teach them? What did he say? Well, clearly he did not teach what the Pharisees and Sadducees taught. That would have amazed no one. No, he preached to them as one who breathed the Old Testament scriptures from his very being. He preached as one who knew the desperate situation of every man or woman he ever met. He preached as one who knew the power of sin and evil in people's lives, what their real problem was. He preached as one who knew well every promise concerning the Messiah and his saving work. He preached with utter certainty that every promise God gave would be fulfilled in every detail. He spoke with God's own finality. Believe in the Savior who God's word proclaims and live. Disbelieve and remain separated from God. As he spoke, a certain man in the congregation cried out with a loud voice as we heard, Let us alone, what have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know you, who you are, the Holy One of God. Well, the demon within that wretched man, of course, knew something before anybody else in the congregation knew it that day. He knew that the one of whom the Old Testament prophets spoke was there in the room with him, speaking to them. He knew that the promises written in God's word were being fulfilled even as Jesus was speaking. This one was the Holy One of God, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. He had come for this very purpose, to destroy sin, death, and hell, and so set mankind free from the power of darkness. And that's what the demon feared. And that's what set him running. With a word, Jesus silenced the demon. And the people exclaimed, what a word is this? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. What a word is this? Now, please note, dear friends, 
I say to you, is, not was. Because Jesus Christ, our Lord, commanded this same world to be preached throughout the world and promised that whoever heard it preached would be hearing not the voice of a, a mere man, but well, what does he say in John chapter 10? My sheep, what? Hear my voice. His word still casts out sin and death within us. That is the whole purpose of baptism, as we sang in that hymn, isn't it? That is the whole purpose in proclaiming the gospel in all its purity and wonder. The gospel still brings light where there is darkness. It still puts the devil to flight. It is, as Martin Luther's great reformation hymn says, the one little word that fell Satan. It retains all the authority and power it had that day in Capernaum when it came from the lips of Jesus. It still astonishes people. It astonishes people to hear Christ's word pro proclaimed as not just another explanation of the scriptures. Another point of view, another perspective. It astonishes the hearer when he or she grasps that this is the very word of God, the word by which each will live eternally or perish. It declares that the Son of God came into the world to give his life for us so that we, by his death, might be freed from sins and then by his resurrection declared righteous before God. It declares that in him is, not might be, is eternal life. It astonishes people on Good Friday, and Good Friday is not very far away, is it? When they grasp that Christ, God in the flesh, actually suffered the full penalty of our sins in his own body and soul on the cross. You tell me what it means when he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That is the cry of one tormented in hell. That's what happened on Good Friday. And they are still astonished when on Easter they realize that we do not speak symbolically or theoretically Jesus rose physically from death on Easter morning. And all who believe that what he did, he did for them, will also rise on the last day to life everlasting. That is the truth of God's holy word. So, dear friends, the Bible is most certainly not the rule book of the Pharisee, whether ancient or modern. And just as certainly, it is not the storybook of the Sadducee, old or new. It is the true and enduring witness of the promises of salvation God once gave to his people, and then of their fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ, his Son, who came into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. The word of God, the good news of life and salvation, is astonishing. It is uncompromising. It is the clear declaration that Jesus Christ saves sinners and in so doing terrifies even the demons of hell. Believe that and you will live forever. The very authority and power of God himself guarantee it. Amen. Please arise.